China up until 2003 was a net exporter of oil. Now it is the biggest importer of oil. And up until this year, it was growing very, very fast. And what that really means is you are growing a giant Achilles heel worth of strategic vulnerability. And you want to preempt that. And that's what this is all about. Sorry, Greta, this is not about the Chinese wanting to become the patron saints of the Church of Environmental Greatness. No, this is China wanting to become less vulnerable. As geopolitical tensions rise, governments around the world are focusing on resiliency and independence, especially when it comes to energy. This week, global energy economist Jan Stort of Piper Sandler joins us to discuss the future of oil and gas supply, demand, and where he sees opportunities for investors. I'm Ed D'Agostino from Malden Economics, and this is Global Macro Update. Jan, it's been a while since we've spoken. I really appreciate you taking some time. I, I've been wanting to speak with you for, for months now because I, I took a small position in, in one of our portfolios in, in some U.S. producers, with the idea being geopolitics is is not being priced into the market and what better way to get exposure to it than having some domestic oil producers and for a while i looked very smart but not so much anymore <laughs> how are you how are you feeling about oil and 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 how it reflects or doesn't reflect geopolitical risk today that's a really fun way to approach all of that because what i would argue is that i would put uh that same BNP entity, equity. Uh, let's pick the one that Mark Leo loves, right? Diamondback. Um, I'd happily put that into the college fund of the local Brooklyn raised, very woke little teenager, because it should have good value, right? Through, I don't know, pick a number. By the time she needs some money, 10, 15 years down the road, right? Now, that same token, what you just illustrated is that these things, they move. Right, uh, and they move because what's happened this summer? What what really happened this summer? It's like, oh dang, Nancy Lazar is right. We're gonna get a recession. Bam, sell sell EMPs, right? Oh dang, some of these guys are drilling out their their core reserves. Sell them, right? Uh, other things are doing really good. Nvidia, sell EMPs, buy Nvidia, right? Uh, all that, all these things that go against them is uh, the kind of a thing that I'm always told. When you invest, you got to hang on to them, right? It's like, and I always go like, yeah, it's easy for you to say you're not the one losing the money. Uh, <laughs> so uh, there is a short-term cyclicality volatility in this space, whether we like it or not. Um, I think your core point that uh, in the bigger picture, we need energy. We're going to need more of it. We have oodles of energy under the ground in West Texas where we can get at it. And we have a political system that allows us to do that for effect, for profit, right? Until quite literally, kingdom comes. Well, I follow those five reasons I want. <laughs> really simple. <laughs> like, uh, and that means that you know sometimes you get a little bit, get in a little bit early, or you wanted to leave a little bit uh, uh, sooner. Um, but um, these things have a uh, yeah. I couldn't agree more with you. They are a natural hedge for all the mayhem that we know is going to be coming our way in the next 10, 15, 20 years. So don't stress about month to month, quarter to quarter. Just if it's a core holding, treat it as a core holding and don't look at it all the time. What I'm getting at, you said it, yes. And in that vein, um, you know, you're always told to also like Exxon. Uh, and yeah, that's why Ryan Todd has Exxon uh, as one of his uh, most favorite uh, holdings at this time, it being a relatively uncertain time and a geopolitically massively uncertain time. Boy, it, it sure feels massively uncertain. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So let's get let's get into uh, supply and demand. I mean, do do you think that there is a a global uh, mismatch between supply and demand right now? Yes. Yes. What's happening? is that demand growth is demand growth is very very fast it's decelerating very fast uh what we see especially in the data this is not me doing any kind of conjecture or forecasting none of that stuff in the data through july in the case of china through august the data tell you 
that there is something going very, very wrong in China, that things are not growing, are in an industrial recession for now going on year number three across Europe, and that increasingly here in America, things are getting softer on the oil demand front. So if you add all of that up, oil, oil demand growth, and we expected 2024, I think I mentioned this the last time I was with you guys, uh, we expected oil demand growth this year to grow by 1.7 million barrels per day, which is basically one, one and a half to 2%. Um, that would be more than normal. And we expected that to be happening because we expected China's oil demand growth to decelerate for sure, but to a relatively trend, new trend, new normal level of plus 300,000 barrels a day or so, the better part of plus 2% in the case of China. We expected America to broadly hold flat and we expected Europe to begin to show some signs of life. Okay, now put in negatives for all three. And the demand growth that we anticipate of 1.7 million barrels a day right now, and we have done the work for Europe all the way through July with the numbers from Monday, the China number from this morning. Um, right now, we expect 800,000 barrels a day of demand growth, half the rate that we were expecting. By the fourth quarter, demand growth year over year of about 400,000 barrels a day. Uh, you might as well call that a recession. That ain't good. And why do you think that is? Is it is it all being? You, I mean, you said it's not just China; it's across the board. It's in in the West. It's a global slowdown, and there is in China there is something both cyclical and structural. In Europe, it's a very extended cycle of an industrial recession. Ask anything called BASF or Mercedes or Renault or some Spanish ceramics manufacturer. Ask any of them. There is a recession of the industrial variety across Europe. Um, here in America, you, you know that there is a slowing or a very slow pace to manufacturing. There is an issue with existing home sales, which means that there is an issue with durable goods, which means that there is an issue that at some point uh, leads the consumer to consume less, which is what we're beginning to see, right? Uh, and then you get an issue with unemployment, and that is beginning. We're in the early phases of that very low unemployment rate to begin to be ticking up. Uh, so all of these three things, so that's just you know China, Europe, uh, America. Well, there's a whole welter of countries that ties into any or all three of them, right? Uh, which then also will be doing less good. I don't know, a little something called Saudi Arabia, where uh, you know, these guys are running a government deficit. They are borrowing on the account of Aramco. They're borrowing on the account of the PIF. Uh, and they are spending money like there's no tomorrow on the city of tomorrow, right? Like Neon or the, the fantastically long mile city. Uh, we're not really attracting uh, foreign direct investment into the kingdom. Nothing like what the projections were. And the money that we are spending, okay, how productive are the tens of billions of dollars that are going into Neon? Now, well, no, they, if you're lucky, they'll be productive 15, 20 years from now. Uh, anyway, that's a long way away for saying that there is a cluster of countries that are working on their own recession. I don't know, South Africa would be one of them. Saudi Arabia, a whole different kind. Uh, Brazil is probably doing okay until and unless we start importing less soybeans and less iron ore uh, and the local government overextends. I mean, we will see, but there are a number of countries that are doing well, but there are not many. Uh, and then a thing like India doesn't carry the global economic growth train as easily as once upon a time China did, right? So, uh, again, that's a little bit long-winded, but, uh, you know, there isn't much going right in the uh, world of oil demand uh, or in the world of uh, global economics, I think, at this stage. There will change. Uh, we, myself, I'm on the record as saying I wanted to see these rate cuts a year ago. Um, we're probably going to get a few uh, in the next couple of months or quarters. That will be about 12 months too late. So we will get uh, a recession of some kind. Uh, with a little bit of luck, it won't be a very nasty one. And, you know, a year from now, uh, America will have begun an upswing. Um, and that will matter, right? Uh, and we will see what the powers in Beijing do. 
uh, that's probably a separate story though. So Jan, what's interesting to me is, is what you didn't say. And, and what I didn't hear you say is that this is a story of transition. It, it's, it's, it's not a story of oil being replaced so much as just weak economies. Because I wanted to be polite. Now you get me into a place where you're going to hear me say rude things, right? Come on. No, and I don't mean to belittle that. There are two very, very important structural drivers or headwinds for oil demand. One is ongoing efficiency gains, right? We are getting less wasteful about how we use gasoline in America or more efficient with how we use diesel in Europe. Uh, more efficient with a whole bunch of things around the world. I mean, the newer generation uh, jet engines promise you probably a steady state 1.5% efficiency gain every single year for air traffic, for instance, right? Which would be up from 1%, those kind of things. That's all going on and very, very important. I mean, just to illustrate the point real quick, uh, gasoline demand in 2019 in America was X, right? And I was doing with that Y mouse, call it a hundred mouse, right? Now, with the same, I'm finally getting up to the point where I'm again doing those hundred miles, right? After the pandemic, it took three, four years of recovery. Well, that's three, four years of efficiency gains. So the miles that I'm doing, the hundred miles that I'm doing in 2024, I'm using 0.96% as much gasoline. I've lost 400,000 barrels a day of gasoline demand purely on efficiency gains. Now, to get to the transition part, Part of those efficiency gains in America is uh, the notion, or sorry, is the addition to the fleet and the slow substitution out of inefficient cars and into very, very, very efficient things called hybrids and EVs, right? And here in America, that's kind of slow going, but it all adds up and it's a big deal and we ain't never going to get that demand back. Very simple. Uh, In Europe, we do a little bit more of that. And the combination of diesel plus gasoline demand is down. Uh, for structural reasons, efficiency gains and substitution. Uh, In China, that's happening far faster, right? Uh, We're probably not quite at peak gasoline demand, uh, but we're getting really, really close, right? Uh, And it's either this year, next year, or the year after that we will, in hindsight, be able to say, oh, that's the year it peaked, right? That's, That's not 10 years in the future. That's this year, next year, the year after. Gasoline in China, bingo. Um, diesel is in all sorts of ways being substituted for. We are throwing all sorts of junk at diesel uh, trucks in China. Uh, one of them is a whole different kind of fuel, fine. And the other one is that we put a different engine in there and we make the bloody thing run on liquefied natural gas, right? Uh, which is kind of cool, um, especially if there's a cool ARP or if, in the case of China, you have gas coming in through a pipe from Turkmenistan and from Russia and from the Tarim Basin, the price of which is stable and lower than diesel often is, right? So it it pays to do that conversion. Uh, And to just the same way that you are uh, setting up a whole EV supply chain in China, you set up a whole gas supply chain for mobility in China as well, just so as to make sure that your oil demand doesn't grow out of bounds, right? Because remember, uh, China up until 2003 was a net exporter of oil. Now it is the biggest importer of oil. And up until this year, it was growing very, very fast. And what that really means is you are growing a giant Achilles heel worth of strategic vulnerability with that. And you want to preempt that. And that's what this is all about. This is not, sorry, Greta. This is not about the Chinese wanting to become the patron saints of the Church of Environmental Greatness. Uh, No, this is uh, China wanting to become less vulnerable. Um, And that's a big deal. It's going very well for them. Uh, Like I said, you're within spitting distance of being able to uh, put a ceiling on your gasoline demand. Uh, Not for sure if they're going to be able to manage it with diesel, but they're sure are trying. Uh, pet camps is more of an issue of the global manufacturing cycle. Uh, and that's, again, you know, one of those stories where uh, we think we have a little bit of an uptrend left in that, um, but we will see. So we talked about global oil demand. Um, any concerns about supply, even if demand goes down? or uh, You know, 
we can manufacture a concern like okay i mean the coolest thing i'm sorry to show my uh my 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 political sensitivity here but the coolest thing today right it's got to have been that the israelis were able to blow up a couple of hundred pages all over lebanon right did you see that story on the exploding personal yes, device yes. Of hezbollah i mean we assume assume that these are the hezbollah guys uh you know, that conflict is a very real conflict. Uh, there is associated with that a supply risk. Uh, it is remote. It is smaller than tail risk at this stage because you've now had several opportunities for either the Israelis or the Iranians to take that war to the next level, and they have politely declined to do that. And nothing is changing in that regard. I don't see anywhere any leading indicators that suddenly the Iranians are more ready to go for a bigger war or the Israelis are more ready to go for a bigger war, right? So that supply risk really is not that big at all. It is small, tiny, remote, whatever you want to call it. Uh, less than, put a number on it, less than 3%, right? I don't know where that number would fit in whoever's algorithm, but if you need a number, that's a number, less than 3%. Um, the supply, so what's going on with supply is that the industry has had, uh, from the summer of 2020, when it became clear that yes, demand had contracted horribly, but, uh, sorry, check, the fall of 2020, when it became clear that we had vaccines that were gonna be able to, sure, to put an end to the COVID pandemic. Right? And at the time we were debating how long that would take, but we knew then that demand for oil was going to come back. From that point forward, we have had super normal oil prices because, uh, you then, as an industry, need to restart, right? You need to pick up a whole bunch of investments that you weren't doing. Uh, you had lost a bunch of supply, and you had uh, OPEC playing uh, their cards very well and holding supply off the market. So you knew from the autumn of 2020 that you needed to back up the truck and buy all those things, Ed, you were talking about earlier, right? Independent oil producers, buy them in the fall of uh, 2020, and that was a whale of a trade. Equally as good as maybe not equally as good, but pretty darn good on a par with uh, whatever. Maybe not uh, all of NVIDIA, but certainly some of NVIDIA. Um, so since 2020, all the way up to now, the industry has played catch up in investment, right? And they produced pretty fantastic uh, supply growth, especially in America. Here in America, 21, 22, 23, we grew supply in 2021. We didn't quite hit a million. But in 22, we certainly did a million three of supply growth, all liquids, including crude oil. 2023, uh, a million five of supply growth, all liquids, including crude oil. And this year, very close to a million, right? Um, elsewhere, we have arrested decline rates in the Gulf of Mexico. We mitigated them to a great degree in the North Sea with offshore investment. Remember, right? I mean, one of the best energy sector uh, subsectors has been the offshore service industry, precisely because prices have been nice and high in the pace to drill an extra step out in the Gulf of Mexico or to develop even the next boat in Brazil. Uh, Guyana has been growing. So that's, a, a, again, you know, a long wind up to saying, um, and the sovereign oil producers are spending oodles of money, long wind up to saying that supply is fine. Supply is growing and could grow more if we wanted it to. In fact, we had in 2021 and in 2019 spare capacity from the sovereign producers of less than 2 million barrels a day. That is about 4 million now, 2x what I personally am comfortable with. Uh, so supply is fine. Okay, so we beat the oil up pretty good, Jan. Let's talk about gas. One, one little thing, if you don't, if you permit, Please. oil. We still think, and we have forecast the oil price for next year to be 80 bucks, $75 WTI. Why? Because we think that OPEC needs that price. We think the Saudis, whom I mentioned, are very good at spending oodles of money, not all of which productively. Um, they are between a rock and a hard place. It's an unstable equilibrium where they are, right? I mean, they can choose right here, right now to go for share. And instead of producing nine, they could produce 11. They could export instead of uh, six, they could produce export eight. Uh, that would price would be 30, 40 bucks or lower, right? Um, now, 
if you tell them that you're producing, you're exporting six and a half, exporting, uh, producing nine, what you should do is export six and produce eight and a half. Why? Because then you're exporting six at 80 as opposed to seven and a half at 40. I mean, I, I think I can do that math, right? Um, and they're in the short term revenue maximizing game. That is their game. And that's what the crown prince will tell you should be their game. And the technocrats will tell you that when they flooded the market in 2020 and when they flooded the market in 2014, the pain was pretty darn awful to the degree that when you ask them now, is that what did you learn in 2014? What did you learn in 2020? Uh, never again. That's what I learned. <laughs> it's like pretty simple shit. Uh, so um, we still think that prices can be stabilized in this relatively comfortable range because the sovereign producers, a.k.a. Saudi Arabia, doesn't really have a choice. Do you think the Saudis still have that much control over the price when they have neighbors that, um, I mean, my understanding is the UAE is eager to produce more yeah. now that they have more oil. They want to produce it while, they, while it's still, while there's still a market. The math is the same for them, right? You, you can say, okay, hold on. I'm the crown prince of Saudi Arabia. Dude, I'm going to believe that guy in Brooklyn who says that, you know, demand is going to go like this. Right? Or the crown prince will say, yeah, whatever that dude says, my business is to get the money while I can. And if demand does eventually go down and I end up producing not a whole lot of nothing, then I'll flood the market. But in the meantime, some other producer could go belly up. In the meantime, the global economy could go into an upswing, right? In the meantime, something could happen that bails me out. Right? So why not take the money and the possibility that something bails me out as opposed to saying, oh, fuck, I know what everybody else knows. Let's flood, flood the market, right? Uh, so... I think they're going to choose for the optionality and the money um, and that the choice is less big, but equally as stock for the two countries that uh, uh, have a little bit of spare capacity, that would be uh, the UAE and Iraq. I read something last night, just started to read the uh, fabulously interesting uh, inter International Atomic Energy Agency's prediction for nuclear through 2050. Right. And I've, I'm, I'm, I'm all of 10 pages into it. But one thing really struck me. Uh, there is a statistic. They said that as of 2023, coal, coal is still the number one fuel used to produce energy globally with a third of global market share. That, that kind of blew my mind. Um, it is, is, and my immediate thought was, isn't that really bullish for natural gas? With prices so low, I mean, what what better fuel to replace coal, at least for now, than natural gas? What's what what's your prognosis? Uh, show me. You, you, you're gonna absolutely hate what I gotta say in that one. Uh, it's one of those things that I, that I fully agree with Peter Zehan about. Is that the more destabilizing you're gonna see around the world, the more that the global international order of things, the more that, that order dissolves, the more every single government is going to want to have security of supply. What do most countries have access to? Coal. Cool. Yeah. Natural gas, sure. Here in America, we're the only country that actually met the Paris Accord uh, uh, CO2 reduction goals, right? because we switched from coal to gas. Why? Because we have gas coming out of our ears. Right, right? we're literally paying to get rid of it in some markets. That's kind of the way it is, right? Yeah. So gas found its way into the power gen stack in a way that uh, very few other places you could replicate. Right? And the Chinese would love to burn gas. Well, it's gonna come from very far away, Tarim Basin, right? If it has to go to, to, to Beijing, it's cheaper and more direct for the Chinese to pay someone to liquefy the stuff, stick it on a boat and sail it across uh, the better part of 15,000 miles, right? That's how far their indigenous gas resources are. Uh, so uh, bummer for them, and they will use some gas. But even in China, the kager of gas demand growth is the square root of literally nothing for the last five years. Why? Because it's a strategic vulnerability, right? Yeah. 
so what have you seen in China? Well, look, build out a whole bunch of coal fire power stations again, right? And their coal demand is up. Again, why? Because they have it. India has coal. It doesn't have enough gas, right? It is going, and your, your energy minister told you, we are going to build out coal and we're going to build out an indigenous supply of solar panels, right? And then the wonderful people over, the, again, you know, let's not name the companies, I don't know, Shell, uh, are telling you that gas demand is going to go up and to the right because that's what our GDP, our population, and our CO2 emission and, and mitigation program says should happen. It's like, okay, sure, you can pay for it. You're going to pay Bangladesh to put up a power plant that runs on your LNG when Bangladesh can do a number of other different things, maybe? Or, I don't know, doesn't have the credit worthiness to put up, you know, to be considered a solvent buyer of that stuff for the next 15 years, right? So you have a few issues with gas, uh, and that is that most people don't have it. What about for Europe, you know, with, with less reliance on Russia? Do, do they move away, or does the U.S. jump in? You remember, right? I'm Dutch. So yes. So I get to be really rude about my fellow Europeans. <laughs> I mean, holy cow. They have not figured out a little thing called energy policy in such a long time, right? It is awesome. It is really scandalous how poorly run that freaking place is. I mean, ask the Germans what they generate most of electricity with when the wind don't blow or the sun don't shine. That will be lignite. Literally lignite, because a whole bunch of people in government grew up hating on nuclear power. And in an absolute sense, they have a point. If or when, rather, a nuclear accident happens, the consequences are too great to run the risk. Okay, so let us, who are rich, just do something else. Like, I don't know, burn a bunch of lignite and buy nuclear power from the French. Like, what the kind of a policy is that? <laughs> but that is, anyway, uh, and we can go forever about this, right? But uh, fair point, the, the Europeans um, bought or have been buying Russian gas for a very long time. And for uh, the better part of 40 years, it allowed for good relations with the Russians, right? Which is something to be said for that. You might have had a war sooner if you hadn't bought the gas. I mean, that's not the way that uh, uh, George Bush the Elder or Ronald Reagan, for that matter, saw it, but whatever. Um, the, now, uh, you are sort of stuck, right? And we can discuss who blew up the North Sea uh, pipelines, whatever. Um, but the, uh, the point is that going back to getting yourself uh, uh, hooked on Russian gas all over again is probably not going to happen on a very large scale, even when the war ends, which we don't know when it does. Uh, so in the meantime, these guys are going to be muddling through uh, which is totally fine. Uh, you know, they have enough gas. The inventories are good. Because, guess what? Industrial production in Europe sucks. Right? It's like you've lost 10% of your consumer demand and you're at rock bottom of industrial activity. Pick up either one of those two and you need a little bit more gas than you currently have. So you have built out your LNG, LNG regas fleet. Um, you're probably going to want to do something with your relations with Algeria, Libya, from whom you can get more gas. Uh, the Turks can funnel a little bit more gas to you from Turkmenistan and Iran, if you want to go that route. Uh, and anybody that tells you that they have gas reserves in the Eastern Med, uh, tell them that I have a better deal on the bridge I want to sell you. Right? <laughs> That's definitely an odd story. Uh, so uh, the Europeans are going to develop more of nukes, which will take a lot of time. That's on page 15 of the book you were reading yesterday. Uh, you'll get there. It takes a very long time to, to grow that fleet out again, but they will. Um, they will build more wind and solar, and they will build more grid storage, and they will get to a future where they are not dependent on the Russians or anyone else, and they will have their own indigenous, largely uh, not so much emitting stuff, uh, nuclear, solar, wind, storage, hydrogen, don't laugh, but they will pay for it, uh, and then some residual amount of natural gas, uh, which they will get through existing pipes, and uh, through LNG. That's, I think, the future of Europe, which means that they have a very, very expensive energy future in the future, which is better than a very volatile uh, energy picture, which they've had for the last 40 years. 
Uh, so they're looking towards stability. Long answer, my apologies. So where do you see, do you see opportunity in the space? I mean, I, I look at uh, like midstream and, and things like that in, in the US are on fire right now. We like midstream. Uh, and you guys know better on what lower rates do for the midstream. But fact is that uh, we do need more pipes and we will run these pipes relatively hard. Uh, we are going to continue to export crude oil, uh, volatile products like propane, uh, ethane, and natural gas. Uh, the LNG project stack, uh, a bunch of things have moved over to the right, but a bunch of other things have not. And whether it's three years or five years, we're going to add the better part of 10 BCF a day of gas exporting capacity to the Gulf Coast alone uh, by, uh, like I said, either 2027 or 2028, depending on how much runs out. Uh, fine. Um, so, yeah, we're going to be uh, producing that little bit more from more places, meaning we need more pipes. So we like midstream a lot. Um, and there's probably a little bit of room to run for that. Uh, now, if we go into a prolonged down cycle, everybody is going to be spending less and there'll be less growth and a few pipes will be empty for a little bit longer. So you got to be careful with that one. Uh, but as a value proposition, uh, we said it earlier, we like the integrated, so we like the, the EMP space a lot, uh, right? Uh, and that sounds uh, tricky out of a recession. Uh, fair. Uh, so we're in for that little bit of a longer haul, if you will. Um, we are acutely aware that we ourselves may like oil um, more than gas, fine, uh, but the investor community loves the gas demand story, story in a way that you cannot love the oil demand story. Very straightforward stuff, right? Uh, you can very easily paint a picture that uh, American exports flowing into the global market grow because even if uh, it is not as kumbaya, as Shell says, a massive growth of LNG demand, you are going to get some growth of LNG demand. And over time, uh, you will find more uses for gas because all the alternatives are not as good, right? Uh, so there's a long-term growth story. And, and who doesn't like a long-term growth story, right? So that's gas. Uh, so we like uh, value in gas. Uh, we like that EQT thing uh about uh where you where you burn your gas for power with fewer emissions uh that pilot projects should come online uh at some point in the next 12 months uh it it will become it will come back in vogue again uh we like uh the smarter of the grid storage plays even though that hasn't performed all that well this year uh there is a massive opportunity in that space right um uh I'm of two minds on refining, frankly, uh, because refining cyclically is in a doghouse, right? Pretty simple. Demand goes uh, wobbly, then refining goes double wobbly. Um, fact is, however, that uh, we will need oil for a very long time to come. Uh, and that means that you need refining in the right places. Uh, so there is, uh, and this is a scary thing to put these two words into one sentence, but there is value somewhere in refining, right? Uh, and uh, we, we like those big, 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 very sophisticated refining machines in the Gulf, on the Gulf Coast, in the West Coast, uh, especially much. Um, so uh, opportunities that's just, you know, within the straight and narrow of energy per se, um, we like opportunities in America more then we like opportunities in many other places because uh, we don't like uh, the long run future of international relations, right? We think that there's too many things going too wobbly and that the world will increasingly become divided. Um, yeah, yeah, I couldn't agree more, unfortunately. And that means that we mostly like, uh, first and foremost, like things, uh, you know, North American, including Mexico. Yeah. And, Jan, what haven't we talked about that we should have? Ooh. Well, here is a little something, something that uh, it goes sideways to why we like the, the EMP space. Uh, and I think I may have mentioned this to you the last time we spoke, Ed. I find it massively impressive how big the American upstream industry is and how good it is at learning. 
right? I mean, people say, oh, just you wait until AI hits the oil patch. It's like, dude, AI has been all over the oil patch for the last 10 years. Where have you been, right? Uh, and it's increasingly important. Uh, sorry, it's increasingly the case that these guys are continuing to find better ways of doing the same old stuff. If you drill, you know, 14,000 plus wells in this country and you learn from every single one of them, you're getting smarter and smarter. It's really straightforward conceptually, but it's very difficult for people to get their brains around the notion that, dude, we had 10% efficiency gains last year. Surely that cannot last. It's like, really? Consider where they came from. Why couldn't it? Well, you know, if the average uptime of a frack fleet goes from 17 to 22, there's only 24 hours in the day. That is a totally fair point. That I do understand, right? Uh, but nowhere is it written that what we thought three years ago was an extremely long well, a three-mile lateral, nowhere is it written that you couldn't have a 10-mile lateral, right? It's just how do you make that mile number nine as good, as well-performing, no pun intended, as, well number, as, as mile number one, right? Um, and that's the kind of question you, you, you probably need to be asking uh, because it, it very simply means that anybody that tells you that we are done growing in America, they don't understand America. That's a great note to end on. Jan, I, I think I said this to you last time. I, I, I have such respect for what you do because I think being an oil analyst is, is both the most fascinating and exhausting role that, that you can have in finance. So hats off. Thank you for joining us, sir. Thank you very much, Ed. Always fun.